Welcome everyone to Add More Markets. My name is Chris. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to take a look at the strategy webinar on Wednesdays as always. We're going to have uh, basically a focus on three strategies. We'll take a look at that one by one though. But first of all, this PowerPoint explaining the disclaimer. The material here is intended for a global audience. Please take into account that it may not be suitable for everyone to get the corresponding information on charting conditions and other details. Please visit AdmiralMarketsGlobal.com, select your country of residence, and contact an appropriate entity. Furthermore, the risk involved in trading for exchange and global financial markets is considered high risk and may not be suitable for all investors. Please seek the advice of an independent financial advisor for more information on that. And this webinar is for educational purposes only and informational purposes. Uh, by continuing watching this webinar, you agree with the disclaimer and the content mentioned here and on the website and in the terms and conditions that we thank you for your attention on this matter. Great. So with that said, we can move on and explain today's topic. It's trading intraday and intraweek. We're using specifically three strategies. Maybe we'll look at something differently uh, this week if we have more time, but let's see. Um, first of all, if you're new in here, um, by all means, please let me know because <clears throat> that will help me understand maybe that I have to repeat or or actually explain certain things. Uh, first of all, uh, if you are not new in here, you've already seen this webinar, so you have more feeling for what we're looking at. So if you're new in here, that would be good for me to know. Um, so I can see the uh, attendance is a bit uh, lower than yesterday. I can maybe the strategies we're looking at are not so interesting as uh, as I thought they would be, but that's okay. I'm glad you're here. Uh, basically, in any case, what we're looking for is always looking for defining the trend. What is the opportunity? What is the filter? Uh, what is the trigger? What is the entry method? This is a standard checklist that you can use for any trading plan. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on moving averages, pivot points, primarily. And the third strategy we'll be focusing on <clears throat> on um, uh, Ichimoku and the parabolic. Oh, there, there you have it. Moving average, trend, and break. Number two is the candlesticks at pivot points, and number three, as I said, the Tenkin and the parabolic break. So that will be the focus today. The first strategy I've explained here, basically looking for the hourly uh, to be aligned and in the same direction. And a 50 minute world too. Preferably both, although you don't necessarily have to have both. The 50 minute could be enough, but if they are pointed both to the same direction uh, and align these moving averages, then you do have a lot of momentum pushing it. So that could be uh, that could be a big advantage. Some filters you might want to think of: news events, daily highs and lows, pivot points, divergence, triggers, uh, basically price going through support and resistance, and the entry could be the break of the fractal or the retest after the break, or even the bounce after the pullback. Trade management, the, the loose trade management could use uh, bottoms and tops, but if you want to use a tighter one, you could even use moving averages. Alrighty, with that said, let me take a look at what we can expect today regarding the news event somehow I shut down my web browser by accident. That's a bit annoying. So hang on as I pull up our website here. Good. That went pretty fast. So let's go to the calendar first of all. And today we can see USD core durable good order, but otherwise nothing uh, pending at this point. Some Spanish PPI though, but that's lighter news. Europe. Italian retail sales, in fact, but really very few Euro news events this morning. We have a lot more in the U.S. section, actually, uh, today. More importantly, GDP and core durable goods. Alrighty, so the Euro dollar had a big up and down yesterday. Um, that down surprised me a bit. The up, I was expecting, we talked about it yesterday, in fact, that Potentially trading it from the bouncing spot would be good. 
Um, so that indeed happened after the pullback. I tried to open my drawing tool one second. Right here, pullback, bounce. Uh, so that did work out pretty pretty nicely. However, we didn't get any follow through. We just actually reversed um, for, for a decent fall, but then eventually found uh, the bouncing spot at the weekly pivot. So if you're looking for price action at the weekly pivot, then yesterday gave a good potential uh, at, for instance, this weekly pivot. So if you were looking for that, then um, that could have been a potential longing in this zone right there. Was pretty close to the end of the day though, so or it was actually already in New York afternoon, so I didn't trade it personally, but uh, I didn't take this downside because I was actually more looking for another bounce. But I didn't take the upside either because we never got a confirmation of the bounce. So that's good. Now we're getting again some upside slowly but surely. Looks like price is pulling away. The entire euro dollar is very choppy, so it's a, it's not really a, a grand environment at the moment. Why do I say that? Well, actually, if you look, funny enough, if you look at the euro interest rate engulfing daily candle, ever since that engulfing daily candle, <clears throat> we had two. Let's take a look. This is the 13th candle that is within that one candle. 13 candles, basically, um, we're not able to, to push through it, except maybe the very first one with a very small wick there. But otherwise, 13 candles staying within that one engulfing candle. So it's, yeah, it's very extreme in a way because it's just um, going nowhere. It's, it's really, there's a slight upside here at the moment, but it's quite a narrow range for quite a long time already. Um, but because of that upside range, um, there could be a potential momentum to the upside eventually, and we can see price maybe go up to the monthly pivot there. Will that happen? We don't know. Uh, you know, price is still having a lot of difficulties with continuing to the upside. It can't break through this resistance, so maybe <clears throat> again it will fail and uh, use this resistance level for some downside, maybe bounce again off this level. We don't know how long this can last. Um, but I am open to the potential upside because the moving averages are bullish and um, we do see that channel, although very weakly. Actually, it's more like still remaining more like a triangle, but like that, but um, there is that, you could also say that, you know, you can connect these lines and it does look like a channel like that. So there's a channel, but with a resistance line. That's what I would say. So same story basically, today looking for the hook back, the break, pull back and go. Fractals are basically tops and bottoms. And how do you know it's a top and bottom? Basically because it's a fractal. Uh, that's the minimum that you would need for a top and bottom. The minimum is basically where you have one candle high that is higher than two candles to the left and two candles to the right. Or you have a candle low that is higher than two candles to the left and two candles to the right. That is as minimum though. If there are more candles to the left or to the right, it doesn't matter. It's just the minimum you need. If there are not two to the left and two to the right, it's not a fractal. It's just a candle high or low. So let's take a look at practical example. Here you have, this is a fractal, why? Because that candle high with the green dot is higher than the two candles to the left and two candles to the right. Now in this case we see a lot more candles to the left, but not more to the right. This fractal has two candles to the left and two candles to the right. Actually it has more, but that doesn't matter. You can have a ton of them. Uh, all that you need is two at minimum. So any candle that has two candles to the left and two candles to the right, that are higher or lower, either the low being lower or the high being higher, you would see that fractal and it would be a top or bottom. So I hope that makes sense. You can find them go by going insert indicators, Bill Williams, and go to fractals. So basically yesterday was a doji, before that was basically two big wicks at the bottom. Um, so the daily chart really doesn't help us much regarding price action. We do have a Rami here, for instance. Um, yeah, it's to me it looks bullish from a, from an Elliott Wave perspective too. Uh, and price is moving up, and the moving averages are bullish. So the pivot points are still below us. So 
Yeah, I, still the same analysis as yesterday, basically. Looking for a break, pull back, and continue. Same story. Yesterday, we had this trade here and the potential for maybe a bounce at the weekly pivot point. Let's see today, we could might finally get the bigger uh, upside continuation. Oh, sorry, I paused my, uh, my screen by accident, sorry. Thanks, uh, Linda, for that. So I was talking about this push-up, this bounce was yesterday's ideas, didn't take the downside because I didn't consider it, and again, the same story, but maybe this time we could bounce and continue higher. So that's the euro dollar. Talking about the eurozone, uh, slightly connected it, connected to it, but not totally. So I hope you don't mind. But I have to congratulate Mike because uh, of his team's victory. <laughs> Great job, winning. I didn't see the match. It was I went to bed. Unfortunately, it was a bit too. Uh, for me, that's a bit too late. But I did see the beginning. But I I read that uh, that you're one up. And then you got a penalty that was deserved. So the last minute, so that must have been very exciting. So I'm uh, I'm happy for you. It was a very tough uh, group indeed with Italy, uh, England, and um, let's see, who did you play against? I forgot who you beat now. That's stupid. Um, no, you were not in that group. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Greece was with um, ah, Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast, Colombia and Japan, sorry, I'm going to get totally mixed up. Yeah, that's still a tough group though, so congratulations. And indeed, interesting uh, development, sad, sad day for Italy, England, well England was already out, but big upsets with uh, Italy, England and Spain out indeed. Good job, Mike. <laughs> so that's the year dollar, let's continue with the pound USD. That's not looking the same as the euro. It looks a lot more bullish. Uh, sorry, bearish. Excuse me. Uh, it has already put the weekly daily pivot point behind us. So if you look at it from a moving average point of view, you can see bearishness at the moment. If you're looking for strategy two, because basically in this section we'll look at strategy one and two. Uh, strategy one is looking at moving averages and taking breakouts. That's basically valid on a euro dollar at the moment. Strategy Two would be looking for pivot point confluence and looking for price action to bounce off of it. So this weekly S1 and the daily S2, for instance, from a price action point of view, strategy number two would be an interesting longing potential if price does bounce from that area. From the strategy number one point of view, the moving average is down. So if you then look at the 50-minute chart, we see bearish moving averages. So this actually is downward potential, right? So that is looking for breaks to the downside, actually. So this would be looking for shorts down to this level. And you, if, you, know, you could almost short it and then close the reverse, more or less. So um, by the pound dollar, I would be cautious at the beginning. Personally, I would wait to see how this candle breaks. Um, it does have bearish moving averages. Probably a better break could have been uh, around here, but okay, that's behind us. So this break is possible, but I want to see how strongly that candle closes because uh, breakouts that early in the day, I am always a bit more cautious of. I like breakouts, but a bit more later in the day. Plus, um, there's nothing wrong with waiting for for a pullback. Actually, the pullback happened here, didn't it? The break itself is has a bit of a wick, so that doesn't look that great to me. So I would be waiting instead, um, specifically because it's the pound dollar and it's early in the day. Also, but this wick doesn't help either. So, but in theory, if the the close would have been a bit lower like this, and it would have been a different currency pair at a different part of the time of the day, then that would be a short because you're breaking this bottom with bearish moving averages, bearish one hour moving averages for, I would say, a TP here, 
for aiming about 30 pips there with the stop loss probably being about 20. So it was close. So that's the two ideas basically, but um, if we do get a pullback, maybe still a good shorting zone down to that level and then a good bouncing spot back up. So both strategies could be valid on this pound dollar for first down, then potential upside. This is uh, actually looking much like an inverted hammer here. Price is uh, definitely looking pretty uh, bearish at the moment on a daily. So it could get uh, you know easily today to that uh, DS2. Well, maybe not easily, but there is that potential. But I would rather still wait for a pullback um, because of those two things. But in normal circumstances, uh, this was very close to uh, or could have been a short. Uh, I'd use the bearish moving averages as well. So let's discuss both strategies. With the break of the daily and the weekly pivot, or the weekly and the daily, let me say it this way, above price action at the moment, uh, that could be a candlestick potential where price does retrace up for more downside like that. That is possible. So that would be the price action point of view with the target down at the weekly S1 and daily S2 as well. Uh, yesterday we didn't get much of a bounce at the levels that I was uh, thinking of, like this bottom here at 93.80. I didn't trade it because uh, we didn't get any, well, this this bull doji, but that was too late for me already. Uh, I wasn't trading at that point in time. Uh, I was looking for a bounce here at 93.75, 93. Uh, 80. Uh, Nenad was looking at 93.70, so that was even more precise because it turned at 93.70, and we had in golf a, a bull doji right there. So, but that was after I stopped trading, so I didn't take that. But after that bull doji, we got shooting start and golfing, uh, so really the bounce was was very limited. That's why, um, if you would have taken the bull doji, but then you see the opposite signals emerging, it's good to be flexible and then exit for about break even at that point, right? You don't want to stay in the, in the, in the trade, uh, or you at least want to reduce the risk if you see shooting star and engulfing um, at that point, because the in that case, the circumstances have changed. Yes, this is a support level, but apparently it's not giving, providing the market much of a bounce if you get such bearish signals after that. So after that, we've continued with the downside. Um, looks now like we're going to be bouncing back up because this momentum looks over. Why do I say say that? <clears throat> because if you look at the hourly chart, we have one, two, three, how many candles here? Five candles closed, not breaking the bottom. No, six candles in fact. Six candles not breaking the bottom. So that um, is a likely actually bouncing spot because of that. If you look at this momentum down, every candle within five candles got broken to the downside, the low at least. So in that regard, this is a decent chance of a bounce. How far could that bounce go? I would say up to the pivot points, probably. From the moving average point of view, it's actually bearish, so the upside is counter trend, so strategy one would not be interesting, unless price actually breaks to the downside. If price breaks below these bottoms, that would change things for downside. 
or if price gets higher for downside. The outlook, uh, according to you know th these two strategies at least, is, is is has turned bearish. Now it doesn't mean the odd USD will be bearish today, but that will be the direction um, to look for if confirmation is given. Already. I'll let the best is to send an email to me and I'll, I'll get you those. I'll get you the indicator. It's, a, it's actually one indicator that has all, all three. Kiwi got a bit of a bounce there, right? Yesterday at this support level, uh, but it didn't get enough bounce and then. Well, it did get some bounce, but it didn't get enough follow through, I should say, before it hit resistance and I made a, a very far fall, in fact. This uh, previous impulse was a lot stronger than, um, than I thought. Sometimes I do underestimate that, I can see, <laughs> because it was a strong impulse, but um, so you never know. Sometimes this happens and you do get the turnaround like that. So it's not always so. In this case, we did see a three wave correction. Um, same story though, it does look like we had the finish of this downside already behind us. If you look at price action, at least we see bullish bounce at the moment with the Harami here. So that too is looking like a bullish bounce. The moving averages are kind of like flat. So from that point of view, it's not interesting. Uh, from the pivot point of view, the same like the audio, the resistance is now above us. It's the four-hour perspective. You can see engulfing twins here, and that is um, probably going to be a bullish continuation. All right, because if you look at all each four-hour candle, uh, basically was bearish and had a close relatively near the low. So the the bears were in control on this four-hour chart, and they have lost that <clears throat> at least temporarily. If you look at the four-hour chart, when you see the previous candle bullish and engulfing like that. Let's see if we get more clues. No, not really. No, not really at the moment. That's about it. Um, max that uh, we should expect probably, according to this ATR, is the day, daily R1, which is about 87. So let's see how far that upside can go. If you put a fib on the bottom to top to see what the correction could be, we know that the price likes to go to two targets, minus 272 target and a minus 618 target, and you can see that there's confluence uh, at the minus 272 target because there we have the daily pivot and the weekly pivot and the minus 618 is actually a bit shy of the, the weekly just in between actually the pivots are in between the minus 272 minus 618 the minus 1272 is all the way at the ATR expected high and the daily R1 so it seems like either this region could be the target or if we get acceleration all the way here would I be trading it? No, because I have at the moment no way to trade it actually. Even though not from this not from these two strategies point of view. The only way to trade it is actually if the moving averages, if price pushes up, the moving averages start to become bullish, price makes a retracement, bounces off the moving averages, then that would change things because then there could be a potential trade up to that level there. That's the only way. With these two strategies at the moment. The other thing, as I said, could be rejection at this weekly and daily, um, like the odd USD. Waiting for price action to uh, emerge there. Dollar Cat is a very slow mover at the moment and has fallen asleep. It's just going sideways. And 
doesn't look therefore that appealing because it's just a um, very tight range in fact only about 20 pips here so I would skip this one personally dollar yen I would skip too it's just too messy prices moving averages are just all intertwined all bungled up and, and hardly any distinction is possible there uh, plus the, the pivot points are all intertwined very close to each other prices in the middle there's no angle no speed nothing here so I would skip it <clears throat> hope that's clear why uh, you know why I make that conclusion for me it just doesn't have the structure that would make it interesting at all well at least for the strategy let me say it this way Euro yen was boxing to the upside but couldn't break triple top made a retracement now moving up again <clears throat> it's struggling too uh, the yen pair really um, very very difficult at the moment this is not typical for the euro yen I mean, in general it's very mild upside that upside is looking so mild that it looks pretty corrective but we don't know exactly if and when a fall then could happen if this is corrective from the hourly everything looks very flat from the 50 minute everything looks very flat so not interesting pound yen is a bit different because the pound dollar is moving down and the yen too so the pound yen is, is finding some acceleration to the downside here Yeah, this is uh, looking a bit different. Actually, uh, this was a good break in the uh, Asian session. Either break below this bottom or this bottom uh, were good trades. Here we had a very good breakout bar not that bad ones here either um, after the break we had to pull back after the break we had to pull back now we're already below L4 so the space is getting tighter because the L5 would be the target which means there's about that left so if an entry is taken here 40, 30 pips left the stop loss is about 25 could still be worth it but obviously the better breaks were in here but still might be worth it. Let's take a look at how this candle closes in a minute from now. <clears throat> if there's not enough space, the trick is to wait for a pullback, get a bit of a better discount, and then the R to R, you know, balance ratio uh, can pr improve from one to one maybe to two to one right if you if you reduce the risk but also add on to the reward you got a lot more potential be careful of the uh, s2 and the atr projected low at 172.50 as well by the way not only the l5 there's a bit of a wick so that doesn't look that great i would rather wait for the pullback in that case and see if we can get some wicks like that somewhere around daily s1 and weekly s1 that would mean there's still 40 pips down to the S2, and the stop loss could probably go above 173, uh, which would make the stop loss roughly 20. So that's a 2 to 1 if price does get up to 172.90, and we have then space down to 172.50. From a uh, price action point of view, by the way, uh, let's see. 
Um, no, the pivots are pretty far away. There's nothing here that makes sense. That would be worth watching for the moment, at least. Alrighty, odd yen. Odd fell a lot. The yen was also falling at the end of the day. After all, it was bouncing back and forth, but it had, you know, its falls and its rises. So when it was falling and the Aussie was falling, this fell uh, a lot further, actually. Um, continuing its downtrend. Here, too, we have daily weekly pivot point at the ATR. So if you're looking for a strategy to price action, this zone for downside is, 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 is an interesting level where you want to, where we want to, uh, might take a look at bounces to the downside. Something to think about. Look for confirmation always, of course, because we never know if price will respect that level. Uh, regarding moving averages, obviously that's bearish. We do have a bit of divergence between these bottoms. So, yeah, I would be careful. ATR is pretty close. S2 is pretty close. Doesn't seem much space to the downside. So I wouldn't be too, too cheerful about the downside as yet. Let's take a look at pound odd. Pound odd is not, it's just messy. Uh, the, the moving averages are not showing any trend at the moment. So from that point of view, we can skip it. From the point of view, moving averages, uh, pivot points too, because it's all pretty close by and prices in the middle. This is different though. The euro odd has pivot points below it, so it could bounce off these. That could be a good bouncing spot for the euro odd to the upside. Very bullish moving averages, so the euro odd could look for a breakout above this H3 uh, up to the R2. So that could be an interesting zone right there, or from here. Overall, the euro odd at the moment has more bullishness to it. And let's see if we can continue. It looks like we are breaking this top. In that case, the minus 272 target would be at 145.85, which is close to that daily R2. Kaylin is asking about a Euro catch short. Let me take a look at that first of all, though. Uh, oh, it's actually next on the list. Good. That's good coincidence. Uh, Euro catch short at 46.53. Yeah, we got a weekly pivot at 62, so and a daily R2 at 54. So somewhere in that region, uh, it could be worth it indeed. Um, so one could either wait. Excuse me. I, one could either wait for a candlestick pattern at that spot, uh, put the stop loss above the candle high, or Take a entry order there at that level that, that you might you might be thinking of, and put a let's say you know x amount of put stop loss there, like like maybe thirty or thirty five. Well, we have an ATR expectation at eighty three at the moment, or eighty six is the daily R three. Wouldn't expect much more than that, would would we? But um, I'm not sure if yeah, it's 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 two ideas, either above there or above the weekly NH5. So in this case, I'm not really, normally I don't take uh, entry orders without either a top close by or a candlestick or, you know, normally if I take breakouts, I have a top in place. If I take a candlestick pattern, I have a top in place. Or if I take a fib, I have a swing high in place. Um, this is a bit different. This doesn't have any, as the moment, natural support level except our instruments that we use. But I don't use instruments for stop losses too much. So, but I know that Nenet 
uses normally a 30 pip stop loss. So maybe maybe that would be a good idea. So but this is this is normally a stop loss technique I don't really use too often. I use candle highs or lows, swing highs, swing lows, um, top or bottoms. Yeah, more often or yeah, those three. <clears throat> then let's say a you know, or that, or that, yeah, less often a pivot like this, for instance. I wouldn't put a stop loss that often above a pivot like that. But I know now that it uses 30, so that could be a good idea if you want to take an entry order right there. If the trend is changing, the, uh, Question: We have four-hour divergence. That's true. Probably double divergence in the meantime. Well, that with that double divergence, I would rather be a bit more cautious personally. But I wouldn't say necessarily it's, it will and has to change. But um, you know the thing is, we don't know how long the bulls can keep control. It is bullish moving average. There is double divergence in the four-hour chart. Yes, there was a big fall here, but that could have been the last fall, and now the, the bulls are back in control. So waiting for some reaction at here or here, so that one doesn't get stuck in a short that basically gets carried away against our, ourselves. <laughs> Might be indeed um, worth it in this case, it, you know, considering the current situation. You know, it's it's a, it's a tough call. I mean, I don't want to discourage you from necessarily implementing a trading plan because um, because it could be a, a, you know the, 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 the turning spot. So. Um, it's always good to, to to follow one's trading plan. Well, that's actually always our goal, of course. So, only thing I could do is, is is add some wisdom there in how you might be. Maybe if there's some decision you have to make within your trading plan, I can try to help. In this case, it's a, it's a, I would probably rather wait for price action confirmation at this level, if I were you. But you know, it's as I said, it's um, I don't want to necessarily discourage a, a good idea. Or or a good trade. Let me say this way: we we never know if it's going to be a good, bad, or trade. Actually, the only thing we know is it's going to have some outcome. But yeah, there is divergence indeed that hasn't been respected for a long time. That's true. Yeah. But that's I said also I think a reason why. Uh, there could be a bigger chance that eventually <clears throat> it's going to play out. I guess we'll have to see how the euro dollar behaves itself, but Okay. Okay. Good. Kellen is also looking for shooting star, something like uh, 50 minute chart. Yeah, I think it's I think it's better because um, I don't know. I like it personally because it just gives a bit more confirmation. Sometimes I don't do it. I don't use it all the time, but I do like it. I do use it more often than not. If there would be no divergence at all, then sometimes I do use a pending as well, or, or Definitely. What do I mean with divergence? Basically, when you have an oscillator at the bottom of your chart, and you're looking at, you're comparing the extremes. So in a downtrend, you would look at the lows of price. They're making lower lows. Then you would compare those with the oscillator, and you see that we had 
the oscillator was not making a lower low. The oscillator was making a lower high, actually, here. Then we had a lower low, at least compared to this one. Not compared to this one, in fact. That was, again, a lower high, but okay. And then if you compare the new bottom again to the previous bottom, we have, again, a lower high. So all the time, price is making lower lows. But the oscillator, which should also be making lower lows, if the trend maintains its momentum, and it's just as strong, that's actually, the, that's actually a sustainable trend that we would like to see. I mean, the, the more confirmation of the oscillator when price is making a new lower low or higher high, the better. If it fails to do that, there's a high chance of, one, a correction coming, retracement, or two, maybe even a reversal. So a correction like this, for instance, or maybe we got a bigger reversal. That's basically what divergence says, because um, price is basically moving, either price is moving away from its average or it's moving towards its average. If it's moving away from its average, it has momentum and it's trending. But eventually, the power that it has when moving away from the moving averages is going to die down. And when it dies down, the momentum dies down, then the reversal to the mean scenario is increasing. Moving averages are like a bit like gravity. When you're trying to, when, when we jump from the Earth, uh, we can do that, you know, if we have a certain speed and velocity and angle and whatever, we can jump from the Earth, and at the beginning we might even jump a lot, and far. So that's basically the momentum we have, and the trend we have is, is allowing us to escape gravity in a way for a bit. But at, at, when, as soon as we lose that momentum and speed, then the gravity, the, the, you know, the gravity kicks in and we fall back, we, we go back to the ground, right? So in a way that's a bit the same with price, then it starts to like fall back to the moving averages. Gravity kicks in. So gravity basically is, uh, has more impact on these moving average, I mean on price, when there's less speed. And how do you measure speed? Basically by looking at the oscillator. And if there's divergence, there's less speed, basically. Yes. Yes, indeed. I did use those because um, those were very handy for 149, 169, for uh, 144, by the way, for um, for this principle, indeed. Why I didn't use it now? Because it's basically a different strategy. Um, this one is is this strategy is actually looking for uh, breaks uh, in the direction of momentum. It doesn't care actually for um, so much for, I should use a different chart actually, 15 minutes, breaks for fi primary 15, and if the hourly is supporting it, then it's good. But it's actually not so interested in, in you know, using those moving averages for, for anything actually. The strategy is just looking for short-term momentum continuation. So yeah, it basically just doesn't use these these two. That's all. So I didn't want to overcrowd the chart uh, with too many. There are already too many, probably. So I do have here an eighty-nine. That's kind of like the equivalent of a uh, just a, a faster equivalent uh, of a 144, just one notch higher or, or lower on the FIB sequence number. So that's 89, the other ones are 34 and um, 21, 34 and 21. So 21, 34, 89, and the shorter ones are Anything between the three and the eight, two and the eight actually, but they're not. You may close this. They're 
simple and typical. That's for to, to understand when price momentum is changing, when the momentum is out of the play. You see here price is uh, only for the trend, 89 is only for the trend. Just uh, under basically only on the 50 minute chart, only on the 15 to have an idea what the uh, 21 EMA is on the hourly, roughly speaking. Yes, I did. 13 and 34 was the ones I used on the hourly, indeed. You can still do it. I just took off the, uh, the 13 on the hourly to make it a bit more simpler. But you can still use the 13. I just put left the 34 you may on the hourly uh, just to make things simple. But that doesn't mean that the 13 is anything wrong with it. That's only for simplicity matters. Um, thinking how could it make it a bit more overviewable. But I don't think there's anything wrong with adding the 13 and having both aligned. But I noticed that you know, in most cases, um, there's only a few candles where they're not aligned, really. So eventually, I found the the value maybe not enough to you know keep it on. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it, though. Um, so what was the question? 89. The use of 89 yeah, for the trend, the hourly trend, basically. I don't have the 89 on the hourly. It's only on the 50-minute chart. Um, so these are small changes sometimes I make depending on uh, maybe my mood, but it's all roughly the same anyhow. If you have 144 or 89 or if you have 13 and 34, it, um, these are small differences. The um, 2 and 4 basically are there to have an idea, but you know, 2 and 4 is just an idea. I do vary that depending on situation to situation. If I'm up in profit, then I might even move up to a 3 and 5 EMA because then um, I'm not too keen or too keen on necessarily exiting uh, very quickly. Uh, at the beginning of the trade, I'm more aggressive because I don't want to um, get stuck in a trade. But if I'm up a decent amount of profit, let's say one to one at least, then I don't mind being a bit more passive on letting the trade develop longer because those are the moments you want to let your winners run a bit when you have uh, you know a potential to stay in the trade longer not not you know with without any reason and you still want to have um, you don't want to throw all the profit out of the window but giving it a bit more space then makes sense eventually when the, when the currency really moves a lot in our way then you want to be maybe tightening up this trail stop loss again because um, the more the price has moved within the day, the higher the chance that price will start to revert back to the mean. So if I would have to put here like tight stop loss, now here's tight and loose stop loss, and here is um, the number of pips in our profit from small to a lot then I would say at first a tight stop loss is good. As soon as the trade goes our way, a looser is good. And as soon as we really get a lot, a tighter is better. This could be the optimal stop loss curve. So that's why when I, this particular strategy, when I use the lower moving averages here, I like to use a 2 and a 4 because it's very tight. If you use a tight stop loss, you don't have to necessarily use it. This is only with tight stop losses in general. I'm maybe a bit confusing now, but with tight ones, I mean you're using these moving averages. With loose ones, you let price go until you get a fractal and you just move along the fractals. So within tight, you can have tight tight, tight loose, uh, or tight loose, right? So 2 4 is very tight within tight. Uh, when you have the currency going our way, you can go to 3.5 or 5.8 EMAs and give it a bit more space. And then move back to 2.4 if you want to tighten up again. So, I don't know, maybe it's a bit, maybe, um, 
goes a bit uh, into details, but that's the reason why I vary these these two shorter ones in any case. Well, the point is basically to catch these momentums. That's the whole goal of this strategy, uh, is not to live through this and then see another fall. I mean, you could do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the difference basically is that you're in the trade here for about one and a half hours, whereas if you're in this trade, you're in the trade for, I don't know, what is it? 24 hours, so you know the, the idea of that strategy is to 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 get these impulses and, and not to stay in for a whole day because that just does require a lot of time and patience. So when there is a crossover here of the faster ones and the the EMA closes above it, uh, that would be the exit right there. That is maybe a bit unlucky exit, but what can I do? No, this is a 2 and 4 EMA of the 50 minute chart. The 5 minute has, has nothing to do with it. The 5 minute will show the same moving averages, but that's just of the 5 minute chart. So everything you see here is attended for the uh, 50 minute chart. Actually I have the 13 by accident here, sorry. Uh, the 89 is the only one from the hourly though. That's just to show the hourly, basically. Um, let me give you another example. Here, this was the downside momentum. Where do we get the crossover with a close, a bullish close above uh, the 2 EMA right here? And indeed, price moves up. That was actually a live trade we took. Or I took. Um, the EuroCAD might not be the best for an example, but oh, can't find anyone. Take a look at the Euro odd 50 minute chart. Here, you can see prices, the move averages are hugging the price. You get the crossover, but you don't get the bearish close below the two. So price continues, and roughly here you get the exit. So not optimal either. It's nothing is never going to be very, I mean, perfect, but not a bad run either, right? But in this case, if you get this big up move, you might want to switch to a bit higher ones like five and eight, and then the whole thing becomes different. I, Uh, let's see. Yeah, still maybe the same candle, in fact. Um, yeah, roughly the same zone, so that doesn't matter. Point is to catch these impulses, basically. Here you got a big fall. If you were in that one, then somewhere here you want to exit. Because after that it does anyhow, it doesn't do anything. So there's no one in control anymore. That's the whole idea. Here we get an upside. Exit will be here. There's still some upside after that, but not really a lot. Let's see. Um, well, it depends which one. If you're looking for the moving averages, I just use the fractal closest, normally speaking. Sometimes, though, 
I would be a bit more risky by using the moving average. But, um, um, you know, that depends on case to case. It's either the moving average or the fractal. Normally speaking, they're pretty close to each other. Unless there's a big, big momentum going on, then their, the moving average could be further away, and then a fractal could be closer. Or if price is consolidating, then the fractal could be further away, the moving average could be closer. But then, if it's consolidating like that, using the moving average is pretty dangerous. Let's see if there's a good example. Uh, Eurod bounced to the upside here, broke this fractal, for instance. So if an entry would have been taken here, then this is just a logical stop loss, right below that fractal. Um, this, well, basically the first one of the moving averages is intended for a trending environment. So that's either breakouts or pullbacks. So breakouts, preferably still when price hasn't gone too far uh, within the intraday framework. So I wouldn't be looking for breakouts if price is right, right in front of an S2 or R2, right? Because then you don't have, what could you still expect? Maybe price could move a lot, but obviously the statistics for price moving to S3 or an R3 are not as grand as they are to the S2. The, 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 the statistics that, or the chance that it happens is just lower. So taking a breakout at that point is not something I would do. So the breakout's preferably within H3, L3, and only the direction of the moving averages, or at max, somewhere halfway L4, somewhere before L4 and H4. If they get, if price does break through the L3 and L4, then I'd rather wait for a pullback before continuing potentially. Um, counter trends I do look for, but only not with moving averages. I mean, that would mean you could use, you could use a moving averages as, as that as well, by the way. But then I'd rather look for price action, confirmations, at some major level. And this strategy is defining major levels using pivot points or confluences of pivot points. Like, for instance, a weekly S1 with a daily S2 uh, could be one. If, if there's a weekly pivot point next to it, that's even better. The more, the better. Then looking for price action. That is, in a way, a counter trend system. It's a bounce trade system. Uh, the trading stop loss with two and four is is better for the breakout. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, the two and four, if you're trading the counter trend one, will not do too too well because uh, the counter trend trade is is going to take some time. What you could do, what I like to do though, is if I if the price action signal um, has a big bounce. Let me give you an example. Let's say this odd yen yesterday. It was bouncing off a weekly pivot here. So one could have looked for price action signal there, potentially. Um, the other way of doing that, instead of, for instance, sometimes you get such a big bounce on the hourly or 15, that if you take it upon the bounce, you're exposing yourself to a retracement before it continues. So the signal of a bounce is then not my entry because it's just it's like a, a trigger, but then I rather wait for a better entry. If I get if this, the the candlestick pattern is is very big, for instance. So another way of tackling that is using these two and four in EMA, but differently. You can use them as entry as well. So for instance, 
if price is moving up here. This is the first bounce. If this is the bouncing spot, let's say price hit the weekly here, or it was very close to it, what you usually see is a first bounce, and if you get a bigger bounce, you see a pullback and a follow through. Instead of taking it at the first bounce, or taking it at the retracement, avoid those, wait for the second bounce. In this case, it never happened. So you avoided actually the, you know, the bearish momentum here. The second bounce could have been potentially this, because this was the first, this is the second right at the weekly. So an entry then, in that case, there could have been an idea. But you already see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine candles not going um, in the in favor of the direction of the trade. That takes too long in that case, so would have moved it uh, to break even or below this bottom, to be honest, because it didn't, you know, you want to see it develop reasonably fast. Um, let me give you another example here. This is um, bounce one, correction, bounce two. So if you wait for the second crossover of these moving averages, an entry here would have done at least something, right? So this is how, it, that, assuming that this is a bouncing spot that you were looking for. I know this is getting maybe a bit complicated, but the whole point of this uh, idea is that instead of taking the price action, if you're looking for counter trend trades at major levels, at pivot points, for instance, instead of looking, instead of taking an entry order, after the candlestick pattern has uh, has formed on the chart, don't enter there, but wait for a second, let's say a second dip, second uh, crossover of the moving averages, double double confirmation, one, two. The reason is that if it is a bigger resistance zone, price will move up to it, for instance, hit it, move down, make a retrace, and then continue forward, uh, downward. So the idea of that, instead of taking the candlestick, because in that case sometimes you're jumping in at the bottom here, wait for the retrace and follow through instead. That avoids um, that helps with trades that still go and get one more follow through. Yeah, the eight eight EMA will definitely help in that. So, you know, counter trend is is requires, I think, a bit more patience, but not too much patience either, because if we give it too much patience, then the whole uh, momentum could still be going against us. Obviously, you know, when we trade a breakout, we expect the price to go in our direction fast. That kind of speed we might not get with a counter trend trade, but it's not like we want to give it all time of the world, because then that trade idea could easily turn into a full loss. At all costs, we want to try to, to, to avoid full losses as much as we can, because a full loss is just difficult to catch up. I mean, it's not impossible, but um, I mean, if you take three smaller losses of 0.25, you only need a normal win of 1.5, and you have already profit. So. It all depends. Like, for instance, if price gets up here to the weekly and, and daily, it's actually on a 50-minute chart, it's already an uptrend, isn't it? So it all depends what time frame you're looking at it. Um, let's see. Let's go, th well, let's, I think, I don't know, the, the last strategy is probably now a bit too late to, to go through it. Let's take a look at all these pairs again, see if there's anything new.
market is pretty quiet though in general. In my opinion, it's it's um, not much follow through. I don't know if you agree. Maybe you see it differently, but there are not big movements. Uh, you know, it's it's not really big, big, big uh, pushes. The only th actually one that did, had a pretty good push was the euro, but I was not looking for upside because it was a strong resistance. I was not looking for upside. I was more looking for for downside. Uh, if anything, not upside. So that uh, that one I missed. Uh, gold. Let's see. We got a break to the upside, but that break was very small. Wow. Hardly went anywhere. 13.25 only. Hmm. That was a quick reverse. It did push up, but the break didn't go anywhere. And um, we got divergence, and it's now moving um, against it. That's fast, fast turn. So it looks like it's back in reversal or retracement mode, I should say. I wouldn't say that this upside is out of the play or out of the scope or not important anymore, but it does show that we had a doji yesterday after breaking that big bullish candle top. So what it does show is um, the lack of follow through to the upside for the moment. So I wouldn't rule out the continuation of upside though, so putting a, a fib like that makes sense and price could bounce here or at that 38.2 fib. There's a monthly R1, a weekly pivot, the daily S3. Not sure if price will get there today, but if it does today or later this week, uh, 1300 is a psychological round number. That would seem a good bouncing spot. Alrighty, folks. Well, um, that wraps it up, I guess, for today. Maybe you have a question. By all means, let me know. Then we can still take a look at that. To be honest, I don't see. I'm scanning the market, but I don't see anything that is very, very interesting at the moment. You're on maybe a bounce from this support level. Maybe the Aussie's weakness, in fact, if it gets up to resistance, like this odd yen, uh, that seems the only thing at the moment. From my point of view, any euro maybe. If, if it shows signs of uh, follow through, which signs such as uh, a bounce off the moving average or the daily pivot, or indeed a break of this orange line and H3. Those are only two at the moment, but of course price um, can uh, look at totally different two, three hours from now and there could be some um, some different things to look at. That could definitely be uh, so, so it's still good to keep an eye on it. But that's at the moment what I would be thinking of. So no questions at the moment. Well, we'll be back tonight, or Nana will be back tonight with his um, expert advisor webinar. Tomorrow we'll have two webinars again as well, this usual trading room in the morning, and Nana and I will have one in the evening um, as usual on Thursdays. So hope to see you then, and wish you all good trading.
And for those football fans, um, let's see, I think we have uh, we have France playing tonight against Ecuador, Nigeria, Argentina, Bosnia against Iran, um, Switzerland, Honduras. So it's going to be interesting. We'll see soon how the second round will look like. I think you know, uh, the part of the second round, actually, we have one section, which is almost all South American part, like Colombia against Uruguay, Brazil against Chile is funny. And the other part is Holland against Mexico and Greece against Costa Rica. So the other section has two European teams against two CONCACAF teams. So that's it's quite a funny mix of, of that second round. Um, if Holland were to beat Mexico and Greece were to beat Costa Rica, then Holland plays Greece in the quarterfinals. So, Mike, <laughs> we uh, we might be facing each other if we win. That would be fun. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that would be interesting. So, let's see. Time will tell. And uh, wish you all a good day and good trading in the meantime. Well, you never know. Uh, you know, football stays football. Holland is has good strikers. That's true, but makes us a bit uh, vulnerable too because you never know what happens. You know, with, if they get injured or something, you never know. So it's difficult to tell. I know that uh, Greece made a big surprise ten years ago against um, Czech Republic, and then. Uh, against Portugal, so <laughs> and winning it. Yeah, those two are really, um, really good indeed. They're they're a, a good form as well. This tournament, so that could be dangerous indeed. Let's see. It's going to be interesting. Very curious if we indeed face each other. So folks, thanks so much for joining and spending uh, your time with us today. And see you all soon.